Hello, and welcome to this special edition of Your South Florida. I'm your guest host, Darius V. Daughtry. I am a writer and director and founder and executive artistic director of Art Prevails Project, a performing and literary arts nonprofit with the mission of making art accessible by providing engaging and authentic artistic and cultural experiences through performance and education. Our most recent production, The Happening, a theatrical mixtape volume for Black Like He, is a creative tapestry that uses the poetry of words, music, and movement to address relevant social issues from racial profiling to the lasting effects of child abuse, the highs and lows of fatherhood, and the strength found in brotherhood. This production explores the complexities of the black experience in America through the lens of black men. Here's a brief look at Black Like He. Has the police ever stopped you with no probable cause. Yes. Have you ever found yourself trying to make yourself seem smaller so that folks in the room will feel more at ease? Yes. And finally, have you ever felt truly free to be all that you've ever wanted to be? No. Well, congratulations, my friend. You're black. But standing in that delivery room, staring into the eyes of my son, I know I'm going to have to tell him I'm a superhero. I can't tell my son that his father is but a fragile man. I can't tell my son that I, I got to be stronger than the weight of all this oppression. That's pushing down on us, man. How fragile. Broken. Heart and spirit, man. Look, man, I know, I know losing your pops was tough. I know. And I want to call. I do, but I just, I don't know what to say. Sometimes you don't got to say a thing. Just, just listen, man. And I just need a little bit more of my friend, man. That's it. My brother. You ain't alone. I got your back. You ain't alone. I got your back. You ain't alone. I got your back. You ain't alone. We 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 got your back. I'm sure he's seen his share of darkness. Bones made brittle from carrying their share of weight for decades. I'm sure he bears scars I don't. Has seen things I won't. Hmm. But he smiled at me. This old man, this master teacher in the art of finding joy, when others have tried to steal it and hide it away, <laughs> I took note, and I smiled, and will smile tomorrow, and the day after when bones are brittle and mouth is a constellation, when another in need in a lesson of finding joy crosses my path. A main thread throughout Black Like He and honestly in all our lives is mental health, a topic that is viewed as taboo and not openly discussed nearly enough in black and brown communities. Any discussion of mental health is often seen as a sign of weakness, particularly amongst black men. That's why today we've gathered some of the cast from Black Like He and a mental health professional to address these mental health stigmas, dive deeper into some of the topics we address in the performance and look at ways to find joy and resilience in life. Joining me are actors Douglas Zaire Goodridge, Jamil Nensu, Denzel McCausland, and David H. Hepburn. We also have with us marriage and family therapist 
Dr. Manushka Santil. So thank you all for being here. Thanks for, thank having, you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So we want to dive right into this. So the show, uh, the main thread in it was mental health, right? And um, I guess we'll start with you, Manushka. When, when you think about mental health in these black communities and with, amongst black men, what's the first thing that you think about? The first thing that I think about is the fact that black men don't have a place where they can be vulnerable and how this play kind of shows the different levels of vulnerability that black men experience in silence. And so it was very profound to watch that play out on stage because most people are having these experiences in isolation and not realizing that I'm not alone. There are other people having these exact same experiences and that's where the conversation should begin, that you are not alone and that it's important to find your community and reach out. It's not something you have to suffer by yourself. You can't, you don't, you can't do it alone. Yeah, so, and, and thank you for that. And gentlemen, so with that, do you all feel, right, you know, that this, that stigma exists where you, you can't have this conversation. Um, so just personally, what, what's your experience around thinking about, you know, or talking about mental health in your own circle with your own friends and family? For me, um, it very much has always been, you gotta stay closed off. Um, growing up was always, as a man or a young boy, it's, you gotta be tough. You have to make sure it's a stone wall. No one can get to, through to your feelings. I'm trying to break out of that myself um, this show kind of helped me to realize that it's a lot of systematic things that are taught to us, brought into us, and things that are very difficult to notice at times. Sometimes you just get used to it because it's what you see and what you know to the point that you don't see it as an issue, you just see it as life. Until it takes something to really show you that there is something better, that it's okay to be yourself, it's okay to be open, but it's very difficult because of how we've been taught. Yeah, so, like, so speaking of that, and, and gentlemen, um, when you talk about how we've been taught, what are some of the things that, that we have been taught or that you have been taught in regards to your emotions and, and what you're allowed to express? Um, a lot of the time for me, a big uh, thing is waiting for the right moment. Uh, and that's in everything, you know, and I feel like that's something that people are told a lot and people feel a lot is I have to wait for the right moment to do this or say that. Um, but there's really no good moment to, to tell someone that you're drowning. You know, there's no right time to say, hey, I'm struggling right now and I need help. Um, so that's, you know, something that, you know, we have to break out of, you know, and stop waiting for an opportunity to seek help and just go get it. Hmm. Absolutely. Anybody else? I love this analogy of drowning because it makes it such a dire scenario where you don't have any choice. And I think the problem is that when we do have the choice, um, we don't take that autonomy because of some systemic things. You know, as men, uh, as young boys, you know, you, you, you basically are taught to suck it up. You know, get punched in the chest and just like suck it up, take it. Uh, you don't show your emotions. For me, having been an artist all my life, I think it's made me very sensitive. So it's interesting that I feel like I'm a very private person in my personal life, but when I'm on stage, I'm wide open. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm, I, I relish the opportunity to be completely transparent. Honestly, I've had trouble trying to find therapy, as far as like professional therapy, because um, by comparison, it, it pales significantly. Um, and again, I've heard people say it's almost like dating, that you gotta really go through a series of people until you find the perfect match, uh, which I certainly have not found. But um, I, I, again, I've always considered myself blessed that the people that are closest to me are very, um, I mean, they're, um, they're biased as far as, of course, their love for me and because they know me, but they also hold me to task and I don't get away with anything. Um, so again, I'm fortunate to have people that are close enough to me that I can really, really be transparent with and unload. So I don't feel, I don't feel as though I don't have an outlet. I do, and mm -hmm. it's vital. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, Manuska, um, David just kind of mentioned uh, some difficulty finding a therapist. Um, so as a black man, and you know, the, with the people you deal with, like, you know, I know that there's oftentimes, you know, difficulty finding someone that you feel is connected and, and understands your experience. Uh, if you can speak to that. Well, 
As a black therapist, I definitely know that when my clients come and see me and they know that I am also black, there's a sense of relief because there are some things that you don't have to explain culturally that you might not necessarily get with another therapist. Now keep in mind, I'm taking your entire um, history and so that's any therapist, but there are some contexts that you could probably leave out because I've also had some of those experiences and they are happy to not have to dive in so deep to help the therapist understand their life story. So it is difficult and I can say maybe 20 years ago there weren't a lot of therapists that look like me and you know it's a whole conversation about why that is that might be another segment but I think I'm just grateful that we are now having an opportunity to see therapists that reflect the community in which they serve. Yeah absolutely and so Jamil uh, to, to that point when we talk about uh, the play and in it your one of your characters uh, had experienced some racial profiling and um, this, you know, this police, disproportionate act from the police. So when you think about that and how that affects us, what do you, what do you think that does to a man, a young man, uh, just trying to navigate the world? How does that, how do you think that affects? So that's a beautiful question, Darius. And I think it causes a young man, at least the way I see it, to become filled with more questions, right? So leaving the house, what can I wear that might prevent this, right? So am I, perhaps if I wear my high school memorabilia, then the person might see me as somebody's son. Maybe they have a son that's in high school. If I wear my college memorabilia, you know, maybe they are an, uh, an alumni of the same school and they might feel some sort of kinship. Uh, should I try to avoid wearing certain colors? Should I? You know, as someone who I would say, you know, wearing a kufi, having a beard is visibly Muslim, like, do, like, how do I go about ways that, you know, try to mitigate my presence? And so similar, like you mentioned the play, you know, one of the questions that another character that I played asked is, do you ever find yourself making yourself smaller in a space so that others feel more comfortable? And it's the same way, you know, I try to get, you know, even if I'm having a down day and I don't feel in the mood to smile, try to smile at everybody, right? So I don't come across as this, you know, as the media would present it, this big hulking brute, but you know, someone's sensitive son, grandson, uncle. And so to answer your question, I think it, it just causes you to do these preemptive, you know, preparations, you know, shoes, clothes, am I driving too fast? Am I driving too slow? If I go into the store and I'm looking for something and I don't see it, should I still at least buy something so it doesn't look like I just came in to do whatever? You know, I, I think I get a lot of my steps in walking around Publix because <clears throat> I can't find what I'm looking for. Don't want somebody to stop me and ask whatever the case might be. You know, is it okay if I bring my bag in somewhere or not? Because again, you know, possibly them thinking that I took something. So I would say that's how I think it affects a young black man is you're constantly filled with these questions on how to prevent these things. Absolutely. So, like, I think I think of it a lot um, about what what we carry. The fact that you know, when you're ready to leave the house, you have to carry this with you. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just a thing that is there with you, and it's not going anywhere. And so, your experience walking through the world, just being alive in this space, already comes with with this. And some of it is, I think, perceived. Right, because if I sometimes I walk into a space and in my mind, I don't know what anybody in there is thinking for sure because I can't read their minds. But there's already an idea that they are viewing me in a certain way. And so how do I need to navigate this space? Right, how do I need to operate from going from point A to point B just to make sure that, you know, things are cool and I'm, and I'm not, you know, seen as a threat. I'm sure if any of you all can speak more so to those experiences and that's what that what it makes you feel like and and how and how you you operate with it. For me, it's kind of I didn't experience it a lot as a kid a lot of times because I grew up in Miami Gardens where a lot of times I just grew up around people who looked like me. So it was never really a feeling of that idea of okay, how am I walking a certain way? How do I react in a certain place? 
Um, it wasn't really until I went to college. And then it was like, okay, there's a lot of people who don't look like me. Then it started to creep in where it's like, how do I move in a certain way where I don't want the wrong idea to get through of when I say something that I'm used to saying when I'm back home, it's like, you can't say that here because someone might get the, the wrong connotation. And so now it, it is that idea of, it's not even just in terms of what I carry, it's okay, how do I think? And now it's like, I have to think differently when I'm in a different scenario because now I can't think the way I do when I'm around my friends, my family, I have to think, does this work in this scenario? I have to always be three steps ahead before I say anything because I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. And for me, that it caused a lot of stress because I overthink anyway, me, myself. So having to overthink even more, it's like you have to process so much. And it's like it takes a whole a lot of toll on you mentally and physically when you go mm -hmm. through it so much. And at that point, then you start to get into fits of depression where now it's like I can't get anything right. You start to have these doubts about everything. Am I doing anything? Like you said, where you don't know exactly what they're thinking, but you have an idea. So now when you're overthinking that, now it's okay, now I know what they're thinking. You don't know, but now you're thinking, I know exactly what they're thinking about me. And then how do I change that? Because I want to make sure I'm not creating this bad cloud. So it's so many things in so many different areas of where having those thoughts in your head can lead you on a downward spiral to where you are, like Zaire said before, drowning. Right. And then you have to find a way to swim yourself up. But sometimes you don't know how. And so that's a, that's a great point, the idea of, of finding a way to swim yourself up. So for me, like, I almost drowned once, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, well, maybe twice. But, <laughs> but, but once, at least once as, as an adult. And what I was looking for was for someone else to, to help me, right? Mm -hmm. I was looking for someone else. And when, when we think about our mental health, right, it, it's often important that there is someone else, whether it's someone that's close to you, a therapist or whatever. Uh, a point in the play that we touched on a lot was was relationships, right? Friendships and things of that nature. How have you found the importance of, of having this positive inner circle, people that, that you are connected to, to help you when you are drowning or just to kind of keep you, you know, laughing or keep you up when things aren't going well? And I'm just gonna interject because I want to preference with, within my practice, the very first thing I tell my clients is that we were placed here to coexist with people. Not things, not places, not jobs, but people. So your relationships matter. The way you start them, maintain them, and end them. And so if we understand that concept as to why we are together and having this collective experience and we prioritize that, then we spend more time in these communities, in our relationships, nurturing them and, you know, basically creating a life worthy of our existence. Mm. So it's something that you have to intentionally practice and, and, and make a priority. Yeah, absolutely. But um, I know for me, like the, 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 the friendship aspect, that inner circle um, is probably the most important part. Like it's, it's, it's important to seek out professional help if you are genuinely struggling. That is very important. But outside of that, having people that you can go to just to be. Like I know from, for me, I have... I have specific tendencies when I am depressed that alter who I am. It makes me a different person in this, in this moment. You won't hear from me. I won't eat. I, I love food. If I'm not eating, something's wrong. <laughs> um, and I have, I have a friend who, during one of those times, knows that I like to be left alone when I'm like that, but it's not necessarily the best thing because I don't take care of myself when I'm by myself and when I'm like that. So what he did was he came to my house, I was asleep. Um, my mom let him in, he walked in, saw that I was sleeping, went to the kitchen, cooked some food, left it, and then, and then left. He sent me a text, said, hey, there's food there for you. Mm. Like having people that mm -hmm. will understand that even though they can't necessarily be there for you the way they want, they want to be, having them be there for you the way that you need right. is very important. And I hear, you know, and you know the therapist, ears is going to perk up and when we talk about genuinely um, struggling and so I would employ people to you know think about the fact that if you were walking around with a broken bone and you would look 
for help immediately because we are so used to identifying those physical ailments and we know to go to the doctor. But when it's time to address the broken heart and the broken mind, we need to see it genuinely happen. So I don't know what the gauge is of what is genuine. And I'm not, you know, trying to make it seem like it's something that's simple, but seek professional help when to help you determine when you're struggling because it's you wouldn't do that with a broken bone so don't do that with a broken heart and don't do that with a broken mind there there is a way to come back there's a way to heal there are professionals that want more people to walk through their doors and look for that support but if you know unfortunately with webmd you know we have a lot of people kind of like self-diagnosing so let someone else help you decide and you know look for that help so I think, you know, that's a very amazing point because if even speaking about on a physical level, oftentimes in the black community, we're not going to the doctor either, right? right. So we, we're, we're, we're trying to find these other remedies or we're going to walk it off. <laughs> oh, is that nothing? We're going we're gonna to be all right, right, right? And so we're not taking care of ourselves in those ways. And, and we think, being. you know, the idea of, I guess, you know, for us, like resilience and, and having to fight through the right. thing, right? So we'll fight through the physical thing. And so, but as you're saying, it's like, that's not good. Not, but neither is, you know, if you're no, if you know, like, I'm not feeling like myself mm -hmm. or some, or this traumatic event happened, you know, and we talk about trauma, whether it's a physical trauma or an emotional trauma, that it's going to leave a mark and it's going to impact how you navigate the world. Mm -hmm. And so you need to do something about that. Right, and, yeah. and that's a perfect and segue into talking about trauma because, you know, when you're trying to explain how does trauma look like emotionally? And I tell my clients, like, imagine cutting a finger off every time you experience a traumatic event and you still continue to live life and you've created a life. So for instance, you had two traumatic events. So you've created a life around those eight fingers and now you're navigating. You don't know what you would have been with 10 fingers. You've lost that part of you. And in, unless you know that it's happened and someone's going to help you unpack that and, and reattach those fingers, you know, you're going through life missing something and you're showing up in these spaces with a deficit and you don't even know that. So it's important to allow someone to help you figure out what is ailing you emotionally so that you can show up in those spaces whole. So, so great, so speaking of, of showing up in the space whole, um, a part of the show that we, that we did was also about joy and resilience, right? So, uh, fellas, I would love to hear what you guys think about, about those things, about how do we, as black men, make sure that we connect to, to joy and resilience. One of the things we, you all, each of you all did was write a letter to your younger selves. And so if you were speaking to your younger self or any other young men, like what would you say about, okay, how do you, how do you connect with your own personal mental health and help find that joy and resilience? I would say um, learning to be okay with people watching you be happy. Like that's a huge thing for me specifically. So if I was speaking to my younger self, I would say that because a lot of the time when I experience joy, I get very excited. And like, um, you know, we were talking about earlier, we have a tendency to make ourselves small mm. to not threaten other people or make other people feel threatened. But just learning to be okay with experiencing the full range of joy because it, you shouldn't have to push your happiness down to appease other people. It's okay to feel and it's okay to not be happy because happiness will come. Sadness will always come, it's a cycle. Um, there will be times of sadness, but there will also be times of happiness, but you have to be willing to accept that. Um, I feel like a lot of times we're so easy to accept the sadness, but we don't want to accept the happiness because of everything else that's going on. Um, like I know I've had moments where I'm going through stuff, but working on shows with you, I've worked with David, and David just keeps making people laugh, working with Zaire. Uh, literally, I've connected with Zaire, and I look at him like a brother. Um, to the point, yeah. <laughs> um, even for you, uh, you've hit me up a bunch of times, like checking on me, and that does a lot. Um, and I would tell my younger self that people do care. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I have to remind myself that people care. Uh, I had a friend who um, uh, something happened, 
And she took time out of her day. She lives far from me, like an hour and a half. But she still took the time to just drive down to see if I was good. And um, sometimes you don't realize just how much people care, which was brought up. So I would tell myself that people really do actually care about you. And it's okay to let those people in and let them know that you actually have feelings. I would say savoring life's moments. Um, on, the, on the drive up here, right, I, I saw a movie theater and I was a bit shocked. To, well, it was a movie theater on the boomers, right? So I was a bit shocked to see the boomers because I haven't been to boomers since I was maybe in middle school. But then to see the movie theater next to it, and I said to my, like, I had to think back. And I said, the last time I was there, this particular movie came out. And, and I'm doing the math in my head. And I said, wow, I was a freshman in high school when that movie came out. And I could probably tell you what that movie was because I, I was able to sit down and savor that movie. I want to think that was maybe the first time I went and saw a movie outside of like a group setting. So it was me taking my little two cents and buying a ticket and getting popcorn and a drink and saying, all right, next time just get a, a small popcorn and a small <laughs> drink and, you know, impressive. but at, thinking about those moments, right, I think oftentimes, especially this generation is so caught up in taking the pictures, posting, taking the pictures and posting that you might miss something the tour guide is saying or you might miss this moment because you're so focused on finding the right caption and so just savoring the meal, savoring the conversation, savoring the view, and, and, and allowing, like, you, allowing yourself to enjoy that, doing things you enjoy even, because I think sometimes we do things because we're trying to keep up with the Joneses, but if, if you like museums and everyone else is going to parties, go to the museum and en enjoy what it is that you're doing. It's so beautiful, the idea of be um, in peace and being able to just linger and lavish in peace. Um, I would say, be honest with yourself. Um, learning to love yourself is something that's been very difficult um, for me. And I wish I had spent more time learning how to love myself mm -hmm. and encourage myself um, and how vital it is to be happy. Mm -hmm. So now at this stage, I spend so much energy ensuring my own happiness and it I, I just how far along would I've been had I started a long time ago and had mastered some of those things so something as subtle as that I feel like it's so vital that they should teach it in school mm -hmm. yes and I would say to all the younger selves <laughs> um, it's very important and, and it's a perfect segue because we don't spend enough time learning about ourselves so systematically we're taught to go to school, find a career, you know, there's all of these systems in place to teach us everything else except who we are as individuals. And so we need to spend that time learning who we are as individuals and really focusing on that. Because how can I tell you what I need when I don't even know? And oftentimes that is what is happening and, and that creates conflict and you know there's so many things tied to just knowing who you are so when you show up in these spaces you show up knowing who you are. Mm. And I, you know I think that's a perfect way for us to wrap up this conversation. I know, I know we could be here all night. Yes. Uh, you have so much more to say however you know they gave me a time limit so we can't be here all night all right <laughs> so but i thank you all for joining me today um it's a beautiful conversation one that is necessary and i do hope that we can continue this in other spaces and that you all continue it in, in your space as well uh, you can learn more about our work with our prevails project and local mental health resources on facebook and twitter at your south fl i'm darius daughtry thank you for watching